This morning we looked at the beginning, the first part of the parable of the prodigal son. Tonight I want us to look at that last part. You know, really when we look at this, this parable, it is really just, it encompasses the entire journey uh, to God. And I think that's why we could do 30, 40 sermons on it, and different sermons on it, and focus on different aspects of it. But tonight we're going to look at the older brother and ask ourselves the questions, am I the older brother? Am I that brother that we see that was read about just a moment ago? You know, it says, now his older son was in the field, this is verse 25, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry, and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. Most of the time, when we address this older brother, most of our ideas and our thought processes go to this idea of accepting someone back when they have repented. And while that is a, a valid biblical principle, certainly, it's probably not the real thrust of this parable. It's not really what the thrust of what Jesus is trying to teach here uh, in regard to this brother. We can look in other places in Scripture, and we can find that idea, though, of accepting the brother back. You know, when you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 6 through 7, Paul is talking about that immoral man that he told them that they had to withdraw from back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Well, as a result of what the church did in their discipline there, this man had repented. And now they were having problems bringing him back. And Paul was like, hey, your brother, is, is he's, you've got to let him back in. You've got you to bring him back into the family now. He has, he has wept. He's mourned over what he's done. And, and so, you know, we certainly see that principle out there. And when people do come back to the Lord's church, we, it is incumbent upon us as children of God to accept them. Well, and, you know, really, when I think about over the past 30 years of preaching, I, I have found that most people do try and accept those that repent. There are exceptions to that, and sometimes it's harder than other times, but I think probably that is not a huge issue among Christians. I think for us to understand what's going on here, we're going to have to understand the context of the parable. Why is Jesus telling this parable? Oftentimes we talk about the parables, and sometimes we don't think about really what, what the conversation was that led to the parable. Last week we talked about the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? And that was in, in addressing the question, who is my neighbor? Well, this, con this parable also has a context to it as well. Back up to verses one, and three, verses 1 through 3 there of Luke chapter 15, and we will find the context for this parable. It says, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near him to listen to him, both Pharisees and scribes, but began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them a parable, saying... Now the parable that he begins with there is the parable of the lost sheep. And then he goes right into the parable of the lost coin. And then he comes to the parable of the lost son. And we call that parable the prodigal, the prodigal son parable, but it would have been the lost son going with the other two. You know, when we look at the lost sheep and we look at the lost coin, we have something apparently of a fairly small value that someone goes to great extent to find. That's what those two, ter those two parables teach. The tax collectors and sinners were of small to no value in the eyes of the Pharisees and the scribes. So there's your comparison. There's what Jesus is talking about. Is how they look down upon these these, these, these sinners that Jesus, they, as they see it, sinners that Jesus is eating with, and they look down upon them, but they have very little love for them. They have very little care for them. They see them as of no value at all. You know, they grumbled that Jesus gave them attention. Well, in context then, the prodigal, as we see it in our, in our parable, he is the, the sinners and the tax collectors. He represents them 
as we see what Jesus is addressing and teaching to the Pharisees that are around him. And the older son, well, that's who they are. The older son is the Pharisees. He is the scribes. And this is about more than just accepting someone back. It's about the qualities of the father that we see in the parable. The older son comes and he hears the celebration and he asks a servant about it and he becomes angry when he gets the answer, right? And he pouts. You ever known people do this? They'll pout looking for the opportunity to vent. So they're pouting, they got their face all down, they're, you know, they're making it very clear, I'm not, I'm not happy. So that somebody will come up and ask them, what's wrong? And that's when they let it all go, right? So that's what this older brother's doing. He's standing outside, he's pouting, and his father comes out to ask him what's wrong. In fact, that father comes out and he pleads with him. And I want you to listen to his response to his father's pleas. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I never have I have never neglected a command of yours, yet you have never given me a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his son when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Did you catch all those eyes, my's, and me's? There's a lot of those in that statement, isn't there? Look, he says, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. Now that fits right in with the Pharisees, right? That the Pharisees kept the letter of the law. And I want us to understand, sometimes we hear that word Pharisee and we go, ooh. We need to understand something about the Pharisees. Keeping the letter of the law was their goal. Now that's, where, that's how they began. Now there was a lot of problems with them. But I want you to know that Jesus Christ never criticizes that aspect of the Pharisees. Never. Their hypocrisy? Yes. Their binding traditions as law? Yes. But never their strict adherence to the law of God. Never did Jesus Christ criticize that. I hear people use that. Well, we shouldn't be so, so strict with the law of God or with the Bible because look at the Pharisees. Yeah, look at them. Jesus never says anything about that. And so we need to make sure that we understand the, the examples that sometimes we use when we throw them out there. He says, and yet, son goes on, you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. See, there's selfishness in this. Remember, we talked about this morning the selfishness of sin, the selfishness of that younger brother, and yet it exists in his older brother as well. He began by reminding the father of all he had done, and now he makes it clear why he did it. He did it for himself. You know, Jesus constantly condemned the Pharisees for practicing religion to be seen, to be praised. In other words, practicing religion for themselves as we see very strongly in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. But the brother goes on and says, But when this son of yours, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed, uh, when he comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. I want you to take note of the complete lack of love for his brother. That son of of yours, right? Not my brother that's come home. You know, it's almost like parents, right? When your child's misbehaving and you look at your spouse and you go, your child's over there doing that, right? It's kind of like that. It's kind of what we see here with this older brother. He sees his brother of little to no value because of what he has done. That's the tax collectors and the sinners. That's how the Pharisees view them and why they view them that way. Because they say, well, look at what they've done. They have no value. And that's what this older brother is doing as well. How dare you offer him something good with what he has done? How dare you, Jesus, sit down and associate with them knowing what they have done? You see the comparisons? Going all the way back to verses 1 through 3. The problem with the older son is not that he is unwilling to accept his brother back. That's not really the problem. 
at least not the heart of it. The problem is that the older son is nothing like his father. That's the problem. Jesus told the Jews that if Abraham was truly their father, that they should do the deeds of Abraham. But they weren't doing Abraham's deeds, but instead they were doing the deeds of their father, the devil, there in John chapter 8. Calling one father at that time was a term of, of respect, someone you wanted to be like, someone that you wanted to emulate. So to call someone father was to say, I want to be like you. Stephen was stoned because he told Jewish leaders that they were acting just like their fathers who killed the prophets. Well, we understand how this applies to the Pharisees and the scribes and the sinners and the tax collectors. But how does this apply to us today? How are we or how can we be like the older son? Well, we are like the older son when we come to all the worship services, when we teach a class, when we participate in church events, when we wear the name Christian, like the brother, we have never left home. We have never been away. We're the good folks. Yet, with all that, we are nothing like the Father. That's how we become the older brother. The house for us, when we think about the Father's house, the house for us is the church. Timothy, Timothy was told by Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 15, he says, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household or the house of God, which is the the church of God, the pillar and support of truth. So we ask ourselves the questions tonight, are we like our Father? Our Father, in this parable, I want you to take note, in contrast to His sons, is selfless. The Father was not focused on just what the Son did to Him talking about the younger one, that he had disrespected him, that he had wasted what he had worked hard to earn, that he had dishonored him in the eyes of others. In contrast, the older brother only cared about himself. I have served you, Father. What was in it for me? That's really what he's asking. Served for the wrong reason. He served for self. He didn't serve because he loved his father. He didn't serve out of respect for his father. He served for what he could get out of it. And the father didn't meet his expectations. He was saying, I am better than my sorry brother. His selfishness blinded him to the reality that they were family. Heavenly Father... Our Heavenly Father, He showed selflessness in sending Jesus to die for each and every one of us. The most selfless act ever done. He didn't have to. It was hard. But thanks be to God that He's selfless. And He did it. Are we self-oriented? Do we serve God and His church asking what's in it for me? Or do we serve for the Father and His family out of love for the Father and His family and nothing else? I have known and during my life seen Christians listing what they have done in the church in comparison to others in, other, in, other, in, in order to get what they want. I've done this, I've done that, I should get what I want. And you've got to ask the question, why did you do all those things? Did you do it for God? Or did you do it so you could ask the Father, what's in it for me? Did you do it for God or did you do it for a resume? 
We are the older brother when we ask, what's in it for me? We are the older brother when we say, look at me. I want to be the center of attention. Do we see ourselves better than our brothers and sisters? Maybe, maybe you've been working in the church all your life. But do you look down on those that maybe haven't quite reached the level of faith that, that you've reached? Do you have a negative attitude toward them because they haven't reached your level of faith? And don't get me wrong, it's great that we serve, it's great that a person serves, but it doesn't ever raise you above anyone else. It doesn't matter how many sermons I preach, it doesn't matter how many people I baptize, how many people I teach, there will never come a day when I'm any better than anyone else in this room. Ever. Because I'm saved by the same grace that saves you. And it's not about me. And we should never let those attitudes enter into our lives lest they make us the older brother. So why are you here today? Why do you serve in the church? Is it about you or is it about God? See, the answer to that question is going to answer the question of whether we're like the older brother. Well, as we continue to look at the Father... We also see that the father in this parable is focused on seeking the lost. The father had a deep abiding desire for those who were lost, those who were were dead. His desire was to celebrate their being found. His desire was to celebrate them being alive. The older son did not care about whether his brother was lost or found. He didn't care whether his brother was alive or dead. He just didn't care. Even, you know, as we look through the Scriptures, everything recorded in the Bible shows a focus on the souls of men by our Heavenly Father. John 3.16 is certainly the ultimate manifestation of that desire by God to reach the lost. Jesus stated that He did expressly as the Father in Heaven wanted Him to do. In His purpose, He said, the reason why He came to this earth was to seek and to save that which is lost. And you go to the night before he dies on the cross in John chapter 14, he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And so Jesus' purpose was the Father's purpose, and that was to seek and to save that which is lost. Folks, the primary purpose of the church, and sometimes we get this a little confused in our modern world, the primary purpose of the church is not to serve our community, it is to save our community. Now, there's a role for serving our community, but it never supersedes saving it. And so we have that responsibility because of our Father's focus, because of Jesus' focus. How many Christians attend services? How many Christians are at fellowship activities and, and service projects, yet do very little to ever teach the gospel or point people to Jesus Christ in their daily lives? If a Christian does nothing to teach the gospel to others, others, they are not like the father in the house. They are like the older brother. They are content with the lostness of the others that our father wants to come home. Unfortunately, many do not have Isaiah's here am I, send me attitude. We, we, We can easily fall into this here's my check, send him kind of mentality, but... It's still about us each individually doing what we can to point people to our Lord. You cannot be like the Father in heaven and have no interest in the gospel of Jesus Christ and its spread to other people. Last of all, when we look at the Father in this parable, we see that he was consumed with a zeal for his house. The Father in the parable had a zeal for his house. He stood... Remember, he's he's standing out there and he's looking for his son. And he was was overjoyed and initiated a great celebration when when his son came home. And he comes out from the celebration and he pleads with his oldest son then when he is angry. The journey home from the faraway land of sin is a journey to the Father. 
It is a journey to be like our father. I want you to consider the prodigal that we talked about this morning. He started so arrogant, so self-assured, and yet he learned that he needed his father. He was destitute and starving, and he realized that his father would care for him. He learned home with his father was really the place to be. He learned what love was in his father's embrace. And as he felt the kisses of his father's lips upon his cheek. He learned what forgiveness was as his father put aside the past to only see the fact that he was home. He learned grace as he was given more than he deserved by his father as he was clothed, fed, and celebrated. He learned the things that last, those things that matter. And every one of those things that mattered, every one of those things that last, he learned from his father. Today, you and I learn everything that is of importance, real importance, from our heavenly father. We learn that we are not here on this earth for ourselves. Heard an old preacher one time say when I was... Uh, young and at a, at a lectureship, he said, God never gave you anything for you. He gave it to you so you could glorify him with it. And there's a lot of truth to that when you think about it. We are here to serve our Father who loves us and cares for us. We learn that we have nothing if we are not in the house of God. We learn what love is in the Father giving Jesus Christ and how we are to extend that love to everyone we know especially those who are, the, are of the house of the Father with us. We learn forgiveness and then show the Father's forgiveness toward those who wrong us. We experience grace when we are made sons and daughters when we really deserve to be thrown into the pig pen. That's what we learn from the Father, the things that matter. This evening... I have to ask Nathan, am I like the Father? You have to ask yourself, are you like the Father? Or are we at times the older brother who does not care and is nothing like the Father of the house? You know, sometimes we say that term does not care and we, we think of it in a malicious way, but sometimes does not care can just be neglect. Not any malice, but... Maybe just not thinking about it like we should. Sometimes, sometimes the journey home does not begin in a pig pen in a faraway land. Sometimes the journey home begins a few feet from the Father's face. But it is a journey that has to be made if we want to be like him. That journey for that older brother had to begin right there. He had to begin right there in front of his father. And maybe that's the case for some of us, and I hope that if it is, that you want to make that journey tonight. It doesn't matter how long the journey is, really. That's irrelevant. How long the journey is. It's only the destination that matters. And that's the father. To be like him to live with Him, to serve Him. Not for me. Not asking what can I get out of it, but simply asking, just let me be a servant like that son did this morning. Just let me serve you because I know how important you are and I love you so very much. If we can help you to get there this evening, we want to do that as we stand and as we sing. Let us reach out and give in the name of the Lord.